friends, Dara Rosa in the Rosa Stringworks Workshop. I wanted to put this little front end on this video. The video you're about to see took me a long time to edit. I would say two or three days, pretty much all day long, and I don't, I didn't keep track. I got sick in the middle of it for a couple of days there, so I kind of lost track how much time I spent on this, but I can tell you for sure it was a huge effort. There was a lot of video clips, and I tried to cut it down to just the basic stuff that made sense. But the reason for this front end is to tell you that tragedy struck on an instrument that I was working on. I really would prefer you don't skip ahead and that you do watch the whole video because there are some very good pointers and tips in this video and I think you'll get something out of it, especially if you like to do your own setups and things like that. So there's some good information in the video and even how to repair instruments and things. But then, like I said, tragedy struck and... Uh, you know, for me, it just wasn't pretty. I just want you to know that I could have easily hidden this and you would never have been the wiser that anything happened. But uh, as you know, that's not the way I do things. And so it is what it is. It happened like it happened and there wasn't nothing I could do about it after it happened other than try to repair the damage. I hope you enjoyed the video. Certainly I understand that I was the one that made the mistake and uh, you know, I'll just be more careful in the future and you know, stuff happens. This is reality TV here. This is not the fake reality TV. I hope you enjoy the video. Thanks for tuning in. Hello friends, Jerry Rosa here in the Rosa String Works Workshop. The project I'm about to start on, I had to put on this shirt. It's not easy being me. And I think this project's going to prove that. <laughs> and, you know, in one way this is a simple project, in another way it's really kind of hard. For a couple of reasons. This is your typical standard mandolin. It, in this case it is a Gibson. It is a Gibson, uh, it says the Gibson Master Model. This is the Bush, uh, you know, Sam Bush model. It also has the Sam Bush deal on the plate here. You saw this in an earlier video, I believe. This is the one that had been in a flood. The man owned it for a few months and then the flood came. It was Hurricane Irene, I believe it was. And it was, he said it was three days before he could get it out. Well, it doesn't look like there was any real damage other than the finish lifted here. So that's not too bad, maybe. And we might be able to match that finish up and make it look halfway decent. I'll do a little research and see if I can figure out which varnish they used on this. My guess is it's nitrocellulose lacquer. That's what it looks like, but then again, I could be wrong. It's basically in for a real setup, and if we can improve this, go ahead and improve it, I think. But uh, it's mainly for a setup. And so the setup in this case, um, it's got the larger frets, which I'm not a fan of, and it's got the radius fingerboard, which I'm not a fan of. But we can still set it up with those things. Where the problem is going to come in, he, the customer specifically says he wants more bark out of this. Yep, he's kind of tied my hands on that. And, and why, how is that? Well, he does want a deer antler saddle, which would definitely give it more bark. Okay, I don't think there's too much question about that. But where the hands are tied is that the strings on here now are, they look to be, you know, 40s down to 11s, which is kind of standard. But the strings he supplied are light. These are Elixir Nano Web strings. The 8020 bronze is this one. Um, I don't know what that one is there, if it's different ultra thin coating. I don't see a, any additional information on that one. But these, but the biggest problem with these, they're 10 to 34s. Well, that's a lot lighter string. It's hard to get more bark with a lighter string. <laughs> so, I don't know, like I said, it's not easy being me. That's all I can tell you for sure. So I'm gonna have to talk to the customer about all that. But I think before I get into this too deep in terms of the setup, I'm gonna check out about this varnish and see what we can come up with. If I can, you know, if it is just nitrocellulose lacquer and I can, 
you know, kind of mask this off, build the lacquer up here, and then buff it together, you know, we might be able to get it to, you know, look pretty decent, really. Um, probably still be able to tell it, but it would look better than that. So let's just see where we can take this. Well, I looked it up, and according to Gibson's own site, it is a gloss lacquer. So I'm taking that to mean the nitrocellulose lacquer. Now, it doesn't say specifically, so I don't know if it could be a water-based lacquer. I kind of doubt it, but it might be. I don't use water-based lacquers, or never have, and not that I have anything against them. I just am not familiar with them. So, I think what I'm going to try here is there's this chip here, you can see this is lifted and it's, you know, it's, I might as well take it off because it's not going to seal back down and there's a bare space above it and so basically I think I can break it off right there and along that same line and I can experiment on that chip and see what I can find out from that chip. So I'm going to start by just taking this chip off of here, and that was easy. It just cracked right there, and there's, some, there's quite a bit more of it here, and I, I just think we might as well get rid of it. Yeah, I just want to get rid of any of that stuff that's real loose right against there. And so we got two large pieces, another smaller piece there, and I'll try just lacquer thinner on it to see if that actually melts it and maybe try some acetone if those things don't melt it it may be the other kind of finish i don't know well i did do a test i took one of those flakes and put it in nitrocellulose lacquer and after just a little bit of stirring it melted so i'm going to assume that's what we're dealing with i'm going to use brushing lacquer here to put it back on on the instrument I think the brushing lacquer is the best choice here. I could spray it on, but the problem with spraying it on is the masking and the overspray and all that. You know, as I was expecting, it's not matching the color, even though it is just a clear lacquer. You know, that's kind of the way all of this stuff goes you know people think they can match this stuff up but it's not like matching paint at all it almost never matches well you can see there I brushed it on you know it's not a perfect match by any stretch um, there's kind of a smoky appearance in this meaning they probably did an airbrush technique and you know, I can do an airbrush technique, but the chances of me matching the color are pretty slim to almost zero. So I don't even know if it's worth trying to go there or not. I think I'm just gonna let this dry. I'm wiping off the binding here with my finger so that get the color off the binding because it did bleed the color a little bit. Now I'm gonna put coat number two on this. It's the next day and you can see that the varnish is more or less dried on here. Now this is definitely thicker than this is obviously. I put about three or four coats on this. You can also probably tell in the video, although I can't tell by looking in the viewfinder, that this is looks a lot darker, almost, almost blackish brown. This is more of a medium brown or something. The only way I'm going to get this effect is with airbrushing, I think. I mean, I could paint some brown on here, but I just don't think that's going to work. I think I'll have to airbrush it to try to match this a little bit. So, I'm game to try it. You know, I don't figure I'm going to hurt anything. At worst case, it'll probably look a little bit better. So, I don't think I have much to lose. Incidentally, I decided to put on this shirt today. I figure uh, it kind of surmises this project. I thought I'd also throw out a shout out out there to uh, the Real McCoy channel. He, it's a sawmilling channel. 
I've mentioned him before. Uh, he's a good guy. You know, he's talked nice about my channel in the past, and I thought I'd just return the favor. Um, if you like saw milling videos, you know, watching somebody run a sawmill, well, he's got a real nice sawmill and does a real nice job sawing up some lumber. The sad thing is he's fairly ill. Uh, I believe he's got some form of cancer and I don't know the full details on that. But uh, I believe the sawmill is going to actually be shut down this November 2019 and I don't believe there'll be any new sawmill videos after that. But there are a lot of sawmill videos that he has in the tank and you could go check them out. So if you get a minute and you're interested in that type of thing, check out the Real McCoy Sawmill channel. I think you'd be happy to see what he's done out there. So I thought I'd go ahead and show you how I prepare my airbrush. Boy, I, you know, I just also want to put that caveat out there. I don't consider myself an expert in this technology at all. So if you've got good ideas and suggestions, feel free to pass them along. I don't mind hearing from you. The, I've got just a little bit of lacquer thinner in here. And I mean, when I say a little bit, probably not even a teaspoonful. I've got this little bullet that I use as a dipper. I'm, and this is the brushing lacquer. Normally I wouldn't use the brushing lacquer, but I think it'll be fine for such a small little job. Ordinarily I use the regular nitrocellulose spray lacquer. I add a little, probably a little more lacquer than I had thinner based on the amount that's there. I've got my dark brown Phoebe's leather dye. This is the kind that's alcohol and water soluble. It also mixes with lacquer fairly well. And I'm just going by feel here. I truly don't know how much to put in there. It's just a total guess. I'm just gonna say that looks okay. I just go by an experience. I mean, it's a guess with a lot of experience behind it. This isn't my first rodeo. I just wanna make that clear. It's just that I, you know, being colorblind, I truly don't know, you know, how to mix this kind of stuff up and make it look right. I just do the best I can with what I got to work with. I was debating in my mind whether I should just freehand spray it on here without a mask or put a mask over it and just hit the area that needs to be hit. I'm going to try that. I'm going to try to just hit the area that needs to be hit. But I got to be honest, this is not going to be that simple. I think I'll just lay the carbon paper here upside down and just try rubbing that seam with my fingernail or whatever. Yeah, it worked fairly well. And we'll put some masking tape around this edge and then we'll just do our best. Well, there's what the mask is going to look like. Basically, all I'm trying to do is get the same effect in this area that we have over in this other area. If I even get the effect, I'll be happy, let alone the color. Okay, we're out here in my spray booth. I've got about 40 pounds of air pressure in my air gun. And... Uh, I'm going to hold it at this kind of an angle so that, you know, I'm not going to spray back that direction or, you know, get anything on the sides or anything. This will be fine. You can see, perhaps see the light brown color getting onto the white paper there. I don't want a huge effect of this but you know it gets darker out on the edge so I'm hitting the edge a little bit more and then lighter as I go through here and I'm just trying to compare it to the rest of the instrument and it doesn't look too bad actually it really to my eye and of course it's dark out here and I can't see in the dark so I'm gonna have to take this inside to look at it better but to my eye it's looking pretty darn close closer than I even thought it would. So we'll take it inside and take a look at it and probably have my wife look at it too. Sorry about the background noise, my wife is running the Bobcat. <laughs> I doubt very many men out there say that very often. <laughs> 
I say it a lot around here. I had her look at it, and as far as she can tell, she thinks it looks pretty darn good. It does even fade like it does on this, she said. It looks pretty good. So, you know, I'm going to take the masking off here and see what it looks like with the paper off, because it's going to look different, I'm sure. Well, it's not right to me. I mean, it doesn't look right to me. I gotta be honest, it just doesn't. It looks close. You know, it's not bad though. I, so I don't know if I should go any more or not. I wish you all were here to tell me what you think. It doesn't look too bad. She thought it looked pretty good, but I, when I take the masking off now, it looks, this still looks darker. I was hoping that that brown that I'm spraying on there would you know, dull it down like this. And that's what I was going for, that effect. And I'm not sure I got that effect. As a matter of fact, I'm pretty sure I didn't get the effect that I was really looking for. It's just not as good as I want. I, you know, you always want better than you get with this kind of thing, always. I'm used to that, but you know, if I strip the whole back off, I could make it look very similar to this. It would never be the exact same color, but I could make it look real good, you know. He doesn't want to spend a ton of money on this, and I, I just, you know, his note basically said, if you can kind of touch that up a little bit, great. If not, don't worry about it. So I'm not going to get too deep into it. I think I'm just going to go ahead and clean the binding back up right around here and just put some clear coats over it. Try to buff it where that you don't see the seam there and call that good enough. I think that's as good as we can do, and I'm pretty sure the customer will be very happy with that based on his comments. That's one good thing about lacquer is it does dry pretty darn fast. The bad thing about lacquer is it takes so many coats to get any kind of a buildup. It goes on very thin. Now, you know, there are some little places like this that the finish is missing. I'm going to go ahead and paint those up this time, too. Um, I'm not going to get as hung up on those. They're smaller. They're not that obvious. And they're on the bottom side where you don't really see it much. But when I do put some more lacquer on this, I'm going to brush it in these other spots as well and try to fill them in a little bit. There's kind of a bubble right here, but the finish is still there. I'm not going to deal with that. We'll let that set up and dry and we'll try some more. Yeah, in that light there, you can see it even more that it doesn't blend perfectly, but you know, it is what it is, and I gave it my best shot. It's been, oh, close to a week now that this has been drying. I used the brush on lacquer, as you'll recall, and you know, I put on probably 12 to 15 coats and it's nowhere near built up as much as the original coat. You can possibly see there that there's, there's a ridge there. Well, if I try to sand that ridge to smooth it out to this, this, this newer, softer finish will sand first and I'll sand through it and the ridge will still be there. I know that just from experience. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this round bladed X-Acto knife that I can control where it's at and I can get it right on that ridge and I can take that ridge down with that first and, and, and blend that ridge into the new finish. Of course your X-Acto blade or any blade that you're going to use for this, you want it very, very sharp. So. I didn't have a brand, brand new blade in this. This is a slightly used blade, but I just hung it a little bit on my Arkansas whetstone, and uh, it's very, very sharp again. Sometimes you need to change up your direction to kill the chatter. Chatter is just where your blade is more or less bouncing. You don't want it bouncing, you want it dragging real smooth. It's kind of like taping drywall if you've ever done that. You just kind of have to feather all your joints out and that's kind of what I'm doing here is I'm feathering across this seam. I 
you can kind of see the seam area there that I'm talking about, that line through there, or maybe you can see it. I don't know how well the lighting is working here on this. But anyway, there is a seam there that you can see between the two, and I just keep scraping the higher side of it and leveling it down to the lower side, and then that little line there will go away eventually, hopefully. Of course, on this, you have to be careful. I'm not putting any pressure on this blade, you understand. I'm just letting it drag lightly over the surface. If you put any pressure on it, you'll scratch all the finish off in a heartbeat. I've got that whole line across there pretty well done up now. Maybe you can see it if I change the light there. And now I'm going to take some 600 wet or dry and see if we can blend this whole area and then maybe go to 1200 or whatever I need to and then buff it out and see what it looks like. Off camera here I've got some soapy water that I've got this, I had the sandpaper soaking in there for a little while. And as I start to sand it right away I see a, quite a difference. Um, probably in the color it almost looks like there's a dark line on my on the repaired side of the seam um, which I wasn't sure didn't want to see that you know, I don't know why there would be a dark line there I didn't put anything dark there I don't know it's just it's one of those cursed things you just you can't get beyond some of those things especially with stain if this was paint, it'd be a different story. But with these stains and things, it's just next to impossible to make them match. Even if you do have good color vision, they just there's just always something that makes them react opposite of what you're expecting. There, and I mean, that's, unless you've done this, you wouldn't know what I'm telling you is true. But it is true. There's always something that makes them react and do something you're not expecting. And just like that dark line, I didn't see that dark line until now. Okay, let's dry that off just to see where we're at. Well, the blend across the finish isn't too bad, actually. It's going to look pretty good, I think. There's certainly going to be able to tell it when you look close, but overall it's going to look pretty good, I think. I would have much preferred to have sprayed the finish on rather than brush it on, but the brush on seems to build up a little faster, and even with 15 coats, it didn't build up enough. So, you know, if I'd have sprayed it on, I'd have probably been spraying on 30 or 40 coats. Ain't nobody got time for that. Ironically, there's a touch of the original finish right here on the tip and it's not blending to the new finish because it's standing up proud so I'm going to see if I can feather it out. Alright, there's still some defects in the new finish so the blend though across it looks pretty darn good but there's still a few defects in the new finish that I'm going to see if I can get out. Hopefully they'll come out before I sand through. Still a few little minor defects in the finish. I really don't want to sand through because that's just going to increase the amount of time and effort that we have to go to to fix this. So I may stop when I get very close to getting these defects out uh, rather than getting them all the way out and then sanding through. Because it would just increase the amount of cost and effort and time and I don't think he wants to do that. So far in this whole thing I don't think I have a full hour yet so that'll give you some idea. So it's not real expensive up to this point. And there's not a flat spot in this area so that's another reason I'm using my fingers but I actually prefer to use my fingers for finished sanding anyway. 
you really couldn't use anything flat on this to hold your sandpaper anyway. Yeah, the color doesn't seem to match really very well at all, but what else is new? I'm going to take the 1200 and work it in now. A little bit of a blending problem with the seam right in here. See if I can get any of that out with the 1200 without sanding through. Hope I can. I don't want to forget about these extra little spots, but on the other hand, those extra little spots are going to be hard to do much with them. But I do want to try to blend them in a little bit. I'm not going to go to the detail on these little spots that I do on the big area. Well, uh, the 1200 made it look pretty good. I've got 2000 now, and we're going to go over the whole thing with the 2000. Then we'll just let it sit and dry for a couple hours here, and then we'll buff it out and see what it looks like. I always like to let them dry, air dry after I've been wet sanding them like that. They, even though it's nitrocellulose lacquer, I feel like the finish does absorb a little bit of water there for a while anyway. It seems to soften the finish for a while. I believe that'll buff now. For a quick and dirty job that doesn't cost too much, I think that's a pretty good job. I believe the instrument has dried thoroughly. I've got a damp cloth here with my semi-chrome polish. And I'm going to hand buff it first and see how that looks. If that doesn't look good enough, then we'll take it to the buffing wheel. I've said time and time again bef before that I always start easy and go heavy, you know what I mean? In other words, try the easy thing, try the quick thing, try the simple thing, and if you have to go more, you can always go more. Uh, you know, less is better at the beginning, anytime you're working on instruments. You know, don't go for the gusto the first shot because uh, you may regret it. Let's just see what we ended up with there. Wow, pretty good. Pretty good. Well, that's not too bad. You know, uh, polishing wise, it looks pretty good. At least it's got a finish across it now, you know, and it, it doesn't look horrible. That looks fine to me. I, I really, if that was mine, I'd be happy with that. At least it's got finish on it. Well, certainly not a perfect job, but not too bad either. And now we can move on to what it's really in here for, which is a setup. And we're gonna do a full, complete setup on this. Just a few observations before we actually tear into the setup. First of all, the bridge itself does lean forward a little bit, which is pretty common. Um, so we're going to try to address that and make sure that it doesn't lean forward when we're done. Second of all, and this is very subtle and not that big a deal either way, but just pointing, pointing it out. Presently, there's more space here on this side of the strings than there is on this side of the strings. Not by much, only by maybe 20 thousandths or so, but... You know, it is, there is more space here for sure than there is on this side. So we'll want to center all that up. Okay, so that's the first two things. Then, you know, I'm kind of picky, so I notice a lot of things. There's a lot of space between these strings. And when there's a lot of space between each pair of strings, that means there's less space between the strings. For me, that's confusing. And it is, it's kind of like, where are my strings? You know, it's like they're all running together. Now, there's enough space between these. These are not extreme by any stretch. I've seen them far worse. But there is that effect. So when I make the new saddle, that will be cleaned up there. But it's worse, in my opinion, on this end. There's, you know, it's almost equal spacing all the way across there. There is a little bit more spacing between the pairs here, but not a lot more. We may have to make a new nut. Now, making the new nut, the problem with that is that where all your time is. That's going to take at least an hour by itself, if not more. So I don't really recommend changing the nut unless you have to. In this case, 
We might have to, I'm not sure. So there's where the work is right now that I can see. I'm looking down the fretboard, you can't tell that, but I'm looking down the fretboard just to see if I see anything obvious. And at the moment it looks pretty good. It's, it's reasonably flat, there is a slight amount of relief in the neck, and it's very, very, very slight, which is fine. There's nothing wrong with that as long as it's very slight. I guess we'll go ahead and uh, tune it up and play it the way it is, and then that way you'll have a basis of comparison. Well, I've got her tuned up. We're going to play a tune on it. I want to tell you a couple of things that are kind of putting some handcuffs on me on this. Number one, the customer doesn't want to use the kind of strings that I typically recommend, which are medium to heavier strings. He's using a very light gauge strings. That's what he wants me to set it up with. In addition, he's using the coated strings. So those are two constraints that I've got to work within. The strings that are on here presently look like they're the medium, like as an example, like a, a GHS A270 or a Diodario uh, J74. That's what it looks like on here now. It's one of those two strings, I would think. Those are some of the strings that I would recommend for this mandolin. I think it sounds pretty darn good right now. I'm not throwing in the towel, but I'll be honest, I don't think I'm going to be able to improve the sound much with the constraints the customer is putting on me. Yeah, the, the deer antler saddle may help, but it's going to be hard to beat the sound of this mandolin, in my opinion, the way it is right now. You guys can be the judge. I've got the camera pushed all the way back just for reference. I got my knee under my table here, kind of as a just as a reference, so that I'll be roughly the same distance. The camera setting draw automatic, so I don't change any of that. of the chord sound. Got a pretty decent sound. I'm just going to play a simple tune for me which is like Red Wing. It's a pretty good sound in mandolin, really. I don't see anything really wrong with it. Uh, just the general things that I pointed out in the setup, I'm not crazy about. Uh, the bridge leaning forward, the, the separation of the strings is feels a little awkward to me when I'm playing it. But other than that, it's pretty good, and it sounds fairly decent, I think. So I think it's, this is going to be a tough one to improve the sound on. Hopefully we can do that, though. You'll be the judge. The customer wants me to buff all this out, and the best way to do that is to remove the hardware. For certainly, if you're going to buff the body, you almost have to take this tailpiece off. The problem with taking this tailpiece off is he has a wooden end pin, and it's in there tight. Those are wedged in and possibly glued in. I hope not glued in, but we won't know till we try to take it out of there. But it won't come out by hand. I've tried and I got a pretty darn strong grip with my right hand and it ain't budging. So I've taken the screws out of the tailpiece. Now we're going to try to put some wedges under the tailpiece and see if that'll pop it out. The wedges have been sanded. I'm going to try to slide them in there close to the pin as possible. The problem is it's a little difficult to do. Okay, it's going in. And I'm just pushing by hand. There it goes. Popped it out of there. That actually worked. And they had a piece of leather in there to take up the space. So we may have to put that back in. I'll save that little piece. But it did pop it out and it, it didn't break anything, as you can see. Which, 
If you try prying on that with a screwdriver, I guarantee you, you'll break it right off. But the fact that this goes all the way around the hole, it lifts it right out of there. That's the only way I know to do that. So hopefully that's a good tip for you. While we've got the mandolin all broke down, I'm going to check the truss rod just to see what it's like. It feels nice and snug, so I'm not going to deal, do anything to it. It, you know, it was fine by the looks of it anyway. I just wanted to make sure there was that it was not loose. We're at the buffing wheel, and I'm going to apply a little bit of uh, the compound to this wheel. This I, I have them marked as the coarse and the dark side. That's the color of this. And so that's the one I use over here. And then there's a lighter uh, side over here, the uh, finer polish. But actually, I rarely use that side. This side seems to do a fine job, and this is pretty much all I ever use. You really do have to have a very firm grip on your instrument when you do this. Especially with these body points, it can grab those and jerk it right out of your hand. And do not ask me how I know that. Well, that's about as good as it needs to be, I think. We'll do the front side now. That looks really good to me. Now, I didn't take these ferrules out. That might be a mistake. I'm going to try to buff it with the ferrules in place. The reason I didn't want to take them out is when you push them out, oftentimes it will chip out that finish. And boy, I don't want that to happen. So I'm going to just try to buff it with it in place. That could be a mistake because it could grab these and jerk them out too. So you never know what you're going to get when you do something like this. Well, that looks pretty good. So I'm going to go with that. Might have to clean it up a little bit by hand. The compound gets around those ferrules a little bit, so that gets a little bit ugly, but otherwise it looks pretty good. I'm going to cut my losses there and call that good. I don't want to, you know, you, you try to do something like this a little bit better and it can backfire every time. So. I'm gonna call that good enough, clean it up by hand now. There's a lot of static uh, that hap builds up on there and so there's a dust and, and you know film that gets on there and makes it look ugly, but I believe it's very nicely polished. I think it looks real good, so we're gonna clean it up at the desk. I've spent about five minutes off camera just wiping it down with a damp cloth and then dry polishing it with this towel and that's making it look really good. You know, there's so much residue that stays on there after you buff them like that, that you just gotta get all that off of there first. And now I think we'll go to the Renaissance Wax, put a nice coat of that on there, and this'll look just about like a brand new mandolin then. Once again, I'm using the Renaissance Wax, available off of, you know, eBay or I'm sure uh, Amazon or wherever, I should probably make up a store and put all these products in it and make some money off of that too, but who's got time? If I had somebody here that could dedicate themselves to doing that kind of stuff, I'd do that. <laughs> but uh, it's just me and all that stuff just takes time and I don't have that kind of time. So you're just on your own to find it, and I don't get a commission. It's wax on, wax off, as they say in the movies. And you don't want to let paste waxes dry very long. I will say this Renaissance wax is more forgiving than some other paste waxes. The paste waxes are far superior, in my opinion, uh, for a lot of reasons than the liquid polishes. Um, I am absolutely opposed to the liquid polishes. And I know some of you are gonna say, well, I've been using them for years and I have, I'm happy with them. Well, fine. If they work for you, go ahead and use them. 
but I've seen them curl pick guards up. I've seen them, you know, make the binding go brittle. If you've experienced those things, I would suggest that your liquid polishes might be the culprit. <laughs> I've never seen those same things happen with paste waxes, though anything's possible. In addition, what I really believe is true on the paste waxes, and the effect is more dramatic on some instruments than others, is that they crisp up the finish and really make the instrument pop. So, in my opinion, you can't do any better acoustically than to put the paste waxes on there. I've seen dramatic differences on some guitars, but I got to tell you, it doesn't happen every time that way. But because it happens occasionally, and I do hear an absolute huge difference sometimes, then I got to believe that it's the best thing you can do for your instrument, period. I've probably told this before, but I really can't tell it enough. It's the truth, and I swear to you, I'm not making this up at all, and I'm not embellishing it. I had a D35 come into the shop. The man was telling me that it used to be one of the most booming D35s he ever heard. I, you know, looked at it and immediately knew what most of the problems were in terms of the sound. I promise you, and I'm not exaggerating, the thing was full of cat hair. I got a full, or not one of those big cans, but the, the smaller can, coffee can, I filled co almost completely full of cat hair. That's how much cat hair was inside the instrument. That was enough to you know, kill the sound by itself. But in addition, on the outside of the instrument, it was filthy cruddy. I mean, it looked like it had been laying out in clay mud for years. And I'm sure a lot of that was from the cats. I don't know what all that really was. It was just disgustingly filthy. So I cleaned it up as best I could did a setup on it, you know, did all the typical stuff that I do, waxed it really good, and I promise you, and I'm not exaggerating, and the exact words of the customer, <laughs> as tears are flowing down his cheeks, and I'm not kidding, they were actually falling down his cheeks, he says, you are a god, and that's what he said. <laughs> Now, I, I wish he hadn't said that, to be perfectly truthful, but that's what he said. And he was that impressed with the sound when he got it back. And it did sound like, it, it went from sounding like a cheapy Kmart guitar to one of the best D35s you'll ever hear in your life. That's how good it, it changed. So, and I, you know, I'm not, I'm not saying all of that was the wax. Obviously, it wasn't but the wax helps, especially on guitars. It really helps on guitars, on acoustic guitars. Now that was a regular furniture paste wax, I will tell you also. I, you know, if I'm being truthful, I gotta tell you, I haven't really experienced too many dramatic changes when I've been using the Renaissance wax, but I know it's good stuff. I haven't been using the Renaissance wax as long as I use the other waxes either. That looks really nice. It feels good and slick now, good and hard. We've given it its best chance as it's built to sound good now. I'm gonna go ahead and just level the frets. And I, I'm laying my file on here and, and, and I go over it lightly first. And I, I, I can generally feel where it grabs, and it is grabbing in a place or two, but not bad. Not too bad. And now we'll have to recrown all those frets. I've got the largest uh, fret file in here. It's 
because these are every bit as big as guitar frets. Uh, they're pretty big. I have modified this and I've cut the edges off of this. So it's a it's still got the radius, but the the edges will let me, you know, curl it back and forth a little bit. Ordinarily, I would take my sandpaper and go this way on this. And 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 a lot of people do criticize me for that, but that fine sandpaper, you can't tell that it does not leave any marks and it polishes on very quickly that way that's the reason I do it it saves the customer time and money but in this case because it's got these heavy inlays in here and they're very hard to clean up with a um, single edge razor blade I'm going to do it the other method which you've seen me do also and that is use the post-it note and polish them one by one it takes longer does a nice job but you know it, it doesn't mess up the fretboard that way ordinarily I don't mind messing up the fretboard because I can clean it up real quick with a single edge razor blade but these inlays make it much tougher number one and number two this one really doesn't show any sign of wear so there's no reason to go to that extreme anyway when you're doing this you just want to clean them up you don't really you're just trying to get rid of scratches. You don't really want to change the height of them, you know? So you don't want to spend a ton of time sanding on them. You just want to shine them up. That's all you want to do. Just a thousandth of an inch can make a big difference on buzzing and things like that when you get your action set really low. Over the years, with this type of end pin I've, and this type of tailpiece, I've learned to leave the tailpiece loose until I get this thing fitted in there. Now you can see this goes in with no friction at all. When you tighten this down, sometimes that changes the friction, but in this particular case, I don't think it will until I put this extra uh, piece of leather in there that someone else had put in there. Now I'm going to you know, try to fit it in there all the way tight, and it went tight, very tight. And then that already tightened up the tailpiece, and now I'll tighten the screws up. And more than likely, that will also pinch that a little bit by tightening these screws up and cause it to even be tighter. It's very tight now. I don't think it could come out of there. I don't think you could pull it out of there for sure. It's very tight. I'm getting ready to work on this bridge uh, and the specifically the feet of the bridge and as I've shown before I always you know put pressure on the back side of the the foot in other words I'm leaning it and I'm exaggerating I'm leaning it this way as I'm sanding it so I'm just putting a little bit of pressure on the back edge as I do this doesn't take all that much actually because all of the pressure is always pulling forward on these bridges. There's a little bit of a problem. The, the, this foot is off the ground out here on the end. This is touching here in the middle too, which I don't like to see that. So I'm going to take a Dremel tool and with a sander and sand some of this out of here. I'm going to just mark it where it's about even. A good way to mark it, I'm just going to kind of do it by eye here as far as how much I think it should be. About like that. That looks good. It's just a guess, guesstimate. But I can go now from the, from the inside of each hole here and mark it, put a little marker across there. And then I'm just going to take a route, uh, the Dremel sander and sand that little bit out there. Not a whole lot, just enough where there's clearance. Well that looks pretty good there where you got it dished out a little bit there in the middle. I haven't let this come off yet so I know this is the G side. I can tell that based on the way the strings are made here. The, the string slots are much bigger on this side than that side. It's important that you keep the bridge oriented the same way all the time. And now 
I'm going to put it on here and try it again. Still off the ground just a little bit on this side. When I say off the ground, I just mean off the top, of course, but it's it's like it would be sitting on the ground. It's just that it's this end is off, off of the top there. Believe that'll do it. Now, as I most usually do, is I like, because this is so sharp now, these edges are so sharp, I like to just take and knock the corners off a little bit, and only a little bit. It's just so that they don't catch on your finish when you're sliding it. All right, I'll put this in the customer's case so you can have that as a backup. These are 10s to 34s. Now, I use 11s to 40s. That's a pretty big difference. So, um, you know, six thousands heavier on the heavy strings, and you know, a thousands on the on the small string. So, you know, we'll just do the best we can with this. But I truly don't think it'll sound as good this way as it would with heavier strings. Mandolins have all the odds stacked against them already. They're they're kind of a chinky 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 sound instrument to begin with, high pitch sound instrument. They need all the help they can get to bring those tones down. And the light strings don't help much on that. I've shown this before, but since we're doing this, we might as well show it again. I just lay the string up here. I just more or less pull it tight, go around the post once, and then more or less twice. And then I go back over the top of those windings poke this thing through, pull it up tight, up, you're done. Now you just tighten the string. You know, there's no, there's no real winding, you just tighten the string. You're, you're basically done. Now I'll put this in here, and it'll hold itself in place that way. And you can see the string, string's already got tension on it. So that's how fast you can put strings on this way compared to the other methods. And it does wind it down the post as I'm always preaching, see? I pull this end of the string straight up and then I just cut it off more or less flush with the surface of this with my diagonals. These grooves are just a tiny bit closer. They're not very much closer, they're just a little bit, which I like. I can tell you that bridge is still wanting to lean forward a little bit, which is a little annoying. I'm gonna look at this end and see if I can adjust this, and I kind of think I can. So I, that's what I'm going to tend to do, rather than make a new nut, I think we can adjust this, and, and really it only takes a minor, minor amount of adjustment. So, I just want them to be a little closer together. Yeah, that looks much better to my eye already. Now on these, on the next pair, as long as those aren't touching, and I don't think they are, I think they're okay, there they're, looks like there's clearance. We won't know some of this till we string it up, till we tune it up. Now the next two are wide, and I'm gonna file each one of them towards this, you know, towards each other a little bit. Yeah, that looks much better right there to me, to my eye. And you really can't even tell it by looking at the nut. I've done this before, so I know it, you know, I felt like it would work. But then again, we may not, I won't claim any victories till we get it tuned up because things can change when you tune them up. Now we're actually a little bit further back based on the scar that I can see there than it was originally. On this side, we're only about a 16th, but on this side, we're about an eighth. So it's back quite a bit further than it was. You know, that's partly because these bridges walk forward. These, these loose bridges on mandolins 
you know, there's such a steep angle here that it just keeps pushing everything forward. So you just got to check them every once in a while and you got to check your intonation once in a while. As I'm being picky here, I'm noticing that this nut is catching my finger here. You know, it may just be my playing style, but I always like to round that off. And so I'm going to cut that out of the way. I've put my felt under here. This one, uh, this has been bent up. I don't know if that was factory or if the customer or someone else did that. But uh, anyway, I put it spanning that bend so that it will rub against the strings really well whenever we slide it on here. And that should keep the strings from vibrating. I often, and I just, to be perfectly truthful, I just didn't think to put the felt underneath here before I you know, put it, get it all strung up. Now, I'm just saying this for the customer's benefit. The customer could easily just put a little piece of felt or, you know, some sort of a, a sticky felt. That's what this is. It just has a sticky backing on it. And you use it like for protecting tabletops and things. And you could just easily put a piece across there and just fold it over the end and back under would be the way I would do it. Uh, so the next time you change strings, you may want to do that. But uh, anyway, it's fine the way it is. It didn't have anything on it before, so it's better than it was. Well, we've got this Gibson Sam Bush model mandolin all tuned up. We got everything fixed up on it. You can see there, you know, a color difference. But you get it, you know, you just hold it out like this. It's pretty hard to see it, really. It's not, it's not obvious, obvious. But at least it's protected now, you know. The edges, I didn't do too much down here where that was a problem. And, and back here, I didn't do too much there either. But, you know, it's covered now at least. It's got lacquer over it. I don't notice these feeling that terribly light. Usually I do. I put light strings on a mandolin and I just feel like I'm playing a little tin can with strings on it. You know, just, just nothing. This feels better than that, I gotta tell you. And I don't know if it's the coating on the strings or what the deal is. But the, for light strings, these are the best I've ever tried. I'll say it that way. Try not to hit it too hard. I'm just the, the antler saddle, I think, does give it a lot more punch. There's a lot of clarity there. Now, keep in mind, the new strings are also going to make it sound a little brighter and, you know, livelier too. So, I mean, there's a lot of things. It's hard to compare apples and apples here. I'm pretty pleased with it. For, for light string setup, I'd say this is the best I've ever heard, to be honest, for light strings. Because um, I typically do not like to hear light strings on a mandolin at all. But uh, this one's kind of making me eat my words a little bit, I'll have to admit. All right, so let's play uh, Red Wing. And I, I've got the camera back as far as it can go again. I got my knee about in the same place on my table. So we'll try it again and see what happens. happy with that. I'm pretty sure the customer will be real happy with that. So it plays easy. Um, it, it plays a lot better to me because, well, the action wasn't bad on it. The action was pretty good to begin with. So height-wise, all that was fine. 
I've got it centered down the neck better. I've got the strings adjusted tighter here and tighter here, and I like that for playing a whole lot better. It was kind of a weird feeling to play it before because the strings were all weird spaced in my opinion. Well, I'm pretty positive that's the best this mandolin's ever been set up. I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you for watching. Tell your friends. Good morning, friends. Do I look like I got any sleep last night? Because if I do, uh, I didn't. At least not very much. The old no good deed goes unpunished thing struck again. It's my own fault. I have nothing, no one to blame. Nothing to blame except myself. Just got maybe in a little bit of a hurry and just a little bit careless and bango, bango, pango, disaster. I messed up this mandolin. What did I do? Well, you can't see it very obviously, I don't think. I've already repaired the damage to some degree. I cracked it right through here. You can probably see it if I get it in the right light. Yeah, there it is, I think. Okay, how did I do that? How did I crack it? Well, in order to figure up the final bill, you have to, you know, put the mandolin away, put it in the case, box it up, weigh it, you know, get all the, get the shipping label basically made. So I wanted to, you know, do that just one time. I don't want to put it in there, have to take it back out and do any more work on it, obviously. So I want to make sure everything's finished. Well, as I started to put the mandolin in the case, I noticed that the case was dirty. Uh, on the inside. Not real bad, but you know, I thought, well, you know, it's the nice thing to do here is just to vacuum the case out. <sighs> well, there you go. <laughs> nice guys finish last. <laughs> so I pulled down my vacuum, which I've done hundreds of times. It hangs above up here, and I have this little remote button right here I push, and it comes down. I, this thing here is hanging on there. It can't fall or anything. And I just do this mainly to close off the vacuum so that the rest of the vacuum system works throughout the shop. So that's not the problem. What the problem was, was this thing. Ordinarily, I don't leave this on here. After I vacuumed the case, I had something else to do with this, so I thought, well, I'll just move it out of the way. And when I started to move it out of the way, this fell off. So I reached for it to catch it, and it fell, and this part here bounced right off the top of the mandolin. Whew. Could be worse, I guess. It could have made a big dent in it. It didn't do that. It just, it was the shock hit of it, hit in the exact perfect storm location. You know, I've said before, that's why I reinforce these areas around my instruments because this area is very easy to break. I mean, you, you can just tap it hard and it'll bust. Well, that tapped it and the shock of that cracked it. I thought I got away with it at first because to be perfectly honest with you, I couldn't see any problem. But then I got to looking at it in different lights and I could see a very fine hairline crack and I went, <sighs> So what I had to do was wiggle that crack a little bit, and sure enough, I could see that it was a crack. It wasn't just a finish thing. And I got, you know, I taped it off. I put CA glue on it, and of course, that just made it show up that much worse. Then, you know, and the glue kind of got on the top a little bit, even though I taped it off. And then that dang 2P10 accelerator, um, I used that and... I don't know why I did because I know that's not the best stuff and it's it messed up the top worse. So then I had to sand and buff and repolish and I did that. And so I mean that's what it looks like right now. You don't hardly see it. I mean it's in real life almost no one would notice it. But you know how I roll. I if I screw something up, I'm going to fix it if I can. So I was going to send it back like this to the customer. And, you know, it's repaired. And I, I actually even started to UPS last night. Then I thought, no, I can't do that. 
you know, it didn't come in here with that line that you can see, and I don't want to send it back with a line that you can see. So, you know, this is another one of those cases where trying to do a good deed may totally backfire and just may make it worse. I don't know. You know, it could. But, I don't know. I'm going to try. It's just, oh, it's just, it just kills me. You just have no idea. You just have no idea how much it kills me. <laughs> you just, you can't even imagine. I... I feel 10 times worse that it happened on, on a customer's instrument than if it had happened on my own instrument. If it had happened on my own instrument, I would have went, oh, well, you know, so what? But the fact that it happened on someone else's instrument under my care really bothers me. And like I said, I, I barely slept at all. Okay, well, so now that I have at least attempted a repair on it already, I have to now sand this back a little bit. And I'm not going to sand it a lot, but I do have to sand it some because I've got wax on there and things like that. Here's what I'm planning to do. I already know this is a nitrocellulose lacquer finish, and it does melt with lacquer thinner. I am going to mix up a strong lacquer thinner varnish, and I'm going to put a little lacquer in it and twice as much thinner in hopes that it will melt this back together. And I think it will. Um, I may have to use a paintbrush and paint it a little bit and, you know, kind of help it melt it. I don't know. But, I, you know, if I don't go too deep, I think we can, you know, pull this off and you won't even be able to tell it at all. I'm also, after thinking about it last night, I'm also going to put a cleat on the inside. Uh, a very small cleat. And, and in that area, it will not affect the sound at all. CA glue should hold it, but on the other hand, CA glue is not nearly as strong, in my opinion, as tight bond. And if I put a little tiny cleat across there with tight bond and let that set for a couple hours before I do anything else, actually, then I think it should work. I'm going to insert a picture here that I sent to the customer so that he could see the damage. Now, I took that picture purposely to show the damage off in the worst possible light. So it shows up better in this picture than it really does you know, here on the video, I think. Anyway, I wanted to show it to him and let him, and I have not heard back from the customer yet. I'm, perhaps I should wait and before I even do anything else, but he seems to be a nice guy, but you know, nice guys can change in a hurry when you start messing with their babies. So uh, it's horrible. I mean, I can't honestly tell you how bad I feel. It's just terrible. But that ain't going to help fix it, so I just have to get started, and here we go. Well, I'm already off to a bad start. Um, the old Rosa curse never just seems to quit whenever I have something like this. It always seems to compound. Sure enough, when I look in there, they have the gauze underneath there, the fabric, to reinforce that. And I honestly don't know how I can put a cleat in there with that gauze under there, it's not going to work very well. So, I guess I'm just going to start with the finish repair. I'm going to uh, take this 600 and I'm going to use it dry. And the reason I'm using it dry, there's a reason, and that is I don't want to get moisture down in this crack and take a chance on something turning milky or whatever. or you contaminating the blend to the finish. So I want it dry. I'm just going to lightly sand here wherever I can see the damage. Mostly because I just want to get rid of the wax and, and the polish and stuff that I put over the top of it. In that light right now, I don't even see a crack there, but... All right, so what I'm going to try then is mixing up some real thin lacquer and see if that will melt this finish and blend it back together. I've got a little shot glass here, and you can see there's just a little bit of lacquer thinner in there. There's not very much because I won't need very much. I would say that I had about that much from the here to the end. That's about how much is in there. And I'm going to put about half that much actual lacquer 
and I'm just getting the lacquer in here right now. And I'm going to mix that in there. Now I'm going to take this thin lacquer and I'm going to paint it right on top of wherever I saw the, the damage. And that's what that looks like. It's the ugly duckling thing on this. You know it's going to have to look worse before it looks better. This stuff should only take about 30 minutes to dry. I'll give this about an hour and then we'll put another application on it. Well, at least I feel a little bit of peace and at ease. The customer emailed me back and he's not upset at all. In fact, he says he doesn't think he should get it for free, that he should have to pay his invoice. But I'm too upset to bill him anything. So I'm not billing him anything and I'm incredibly thankful he's understanding. The first coat has dried, as you can see. Yes, it looks worse than it did, I know that, but that's just the norm in this process. I'm putting the second coat on right now. As it dried, I could still see a line there. Not much, but some. So we'll let this dry a couple hours, maybe even do a tiny light sanding on that, and then put maybe one more coat on it, and I think that'll be enough. I got to tell you, I am truly blessed to have such a wonderful customer. He sent me an email back and he said, hey, everything is fine. Don't worry about it. He says, the thing survived the flood. He says, I know you've made it play better. And as long as you think it's solid there on the crack, don't worry about it. I told him I was very thankful for his understanding and that understanding was payment enough and I, so I sent him a reply via email basically saying that. Well, he just called me and and he wanted to assure me that he's perfectly fine paying the invoice and that he really does, you know, want to pay it and he doesn't want me to do it for free and et cetera and so forth. So that's an incredibly understanding customer and I am so terribly thankful for that. I, I, I can't even tell you. It's just, it just takes a big load right off my shoulders. Um, you know, I am still doing my best right as we speak to make this look like, it, you know, make it go away. And, and again, it's still in the ugly duckling stage. I'm pretty sure it's going to be invisible when I'm done. Anyway, he's, he's very, very, very understanding, very nice. And in fact, he's actually going to send me yet another instrument to work on. So, and, and he also has another, I think, two more instruments in the other part of the shop that he had sent back when he sent this mandolin. And these have been in here a long time. So he's incredibly understanding. So I'm gonna do everything I can for him to try to, you know, keep him that way. <laughs> and, you know, I, I agreed that I would go ahead and send an invoice, but I was definitely going to discount it. And he said, don't worry about that, don't do that. <laughs> but I just honestly can't send it at a full price invoice. So I really am incredibly thankful. He's the one I did the Dobro for recently that Tut Taylor Dobro, and uh, you know he sent me a very nice monetary tip later also. So he's just an incredibly nice person, obviously. And I really am thankful for that. Well, after many coats of lacquer here to fill in the uh, cracked finish there, and several days drying, I'm going to use a little bit of 600 water dry, and I'm doing it dry again. And we're just going to See if we can level that out now and get rid of the little minor crack that was there. The, the property of this lacquer is that it, it'll find the crack and it, it expands away from the crack. And it, it just leaves the crack and it just drives you nuts because you'll, you'll put lacquer on top of lacquer on top of lacquer on top of lacquer and it can be that tiniest crack and it just keeps expanding away from the crack. It's just a property of the lacquer. It drives me absolutely bonkers. And so, you know, it takes coat after coat after coat after coat of this stuff. I probably put 10, 12 coats just right on here and I can still see the darn line. You know, it. any other kind of finish would just, it would sink down to the lowest pot because this is in a low spot, and, but not this. This stuff pushes away from it. It drives me bonkers. If that one property didn't exist,
I wouldn't have anything to complain about about lacquer because I really do like it overall. I just hate that one aspect of it. If you have a little pinhole or a, or a crack or anything, it always goes away from that spot. And it does it every time. It's not just a fluke thing. And those of you who have used it know that already. I'm preaching to the choir. But if you've never used it, that's what you're dealing with. And it is a pain in the neck. Now, I can't really tell if it's going away for sure. It looks like it's mostly going away. But you can probably see the little tiny line right in here if I turn it just right and you can probably see what I'm fighting. It's a real pain in the neck. It's a very very minor thing at this point so I should be able to get over it I think. I know a lot of shops probably would have just fixed it and not said anything to the customer but that's not how I roll so you know, I think it's fixed where I don't think anybody's going to be able to tell it, assuming that I can buff it out now. Well, there you go. I don't see it now. It's pretty much gone. You know, obviously, I totally regret that it happened. It just, one of those things that once it happened, there was no one doing it, you know, and it just, it happened. And I hated it customer was incredibly nice about it and I you know like I said I could have probably fixed it like this sent it back to him he would have never known but that's just not how I roll so there you go I'm going to uh, put a little wax on that area because I took the wax back off yeah that looks nice I don't really think anyone can tell that happened now. The wiper down, this time I'm putting it in the case. Well friends, you know, it was very upsetting to me to have an accident happen to an instrument that comes in here. You know, I I don't even know how to what to say about it. It's just one of those things that happened and all I can tell you is that's just gonna make me that much more careful in the future. Hope you enjoyed this. Thank you for watching my videos. God bless y'all.